And so we're going to hear some important catalysts for innovation uh, for education. And I'd like to give a warm welcome to Giancarlo Botto from uh, Catalyst, please. Good morning, everybody. Let me get the slides uh, up here. Fantastic. So I'm going to ask, start with a question. I'm going to get it opened here so we get it going. Make sure the clickers, there we go. Let's see your hands in the air. If you can think of a teacher who's made a significant, oh, look at this participation. I didn't even tell you what you had to put your hand up for. And you already put your hands up. This is, this is great. They're already awake. The drummers did their job. So, so here's the question. Put your hands up if you could think of a teacher who's made a significant impact on your life. Hands up. If you could think of a teacher in your life that's had a significant impact on your life. OK, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you can think of two teachers. Keep your hand up if you can think of two teachers. Keep your hand up if you can think of three teachers. Keep your hand up if you can think of four teachers. Keep your hand up if you can think of five teachers. Okay, everybody look around the room. Keep your hands up, the people who have five up. People look around the room. I ask this question all over the world, and every time I get to five, I can count on one hand how many people still have their hands up. Why is that? Let's think about it. How many teachers do you experience in your lives? 20, 30? Yet less than five have a significant impact on our lives? It's my belief that every single student on this planet has the capacity to do something great in this world. And it is teachers every single day who have this unique opportunity to make this a reality. And every single one of you in these seats are the ones who can create the conditions to make this a reality. Now that hand that you put up, do me a favor, turn to the person to the left or to the right or behind. If you haven't introduced yourself yet to them, please do so, so go ahead. Person to the left, to the right, or behind. Make sure you get to know the people around you. <laughs> 10 more seconds. Three seconds. OK, with that same hand that you put up and that same hand that you used to shake someone's hand, do me a favor and take out your device. Could be your phone, could be your tablet, could be a laptop, whatever it is. Take out your device. And what I want to do is connect your minds. I want to connect your brains to everybody else's brain in this room. And this is what we're going to do. So take out your phone. Go to hellosmart.com. You're going to get to this page. You're going to select Join as Guest. And it's going to ask you to put in a number. Once you put that number, your brain is going to be connected to the brains of everybody else in this room. And you'll see why that's important. So go ahead, take out your phones, connect into hellosmart.com. And we're going to use this throughout. So uh, if, uh, uh, now's a good time to get it set up. If you don't have it set up, at least if the person beside you sets it up, that would be fantastic. I see this gentleman is working diligently and connecting. Fantastic. Let's all get connected. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you a question. And you're going to share your answer with the rest of the room. It's going to be anonymous, so we're not going to know who answered what. But I want you all to see how everybody personally feels about the answer to this next question. So go to hellosmart.com, join as a guest, put in the number. I see that people are connecting in. Now, you're going to answer with a word, and you can answer with more than one word. But I want you to think of your children. Now, how many of you have children in the audience? Hands up if you have a child. And the rest of you know about children. They're like little people. Yes? OK. So, so what I want you to do is think of your children, your son, your daughter, or your sons and your daughters. If you don't have children, think of a niece, a nephew. I want you to think of a child that's dear, near and dear to your heart. And I'm going to ask you this question. What do you hope for that child? What do you want them to know and to be able to do when they leave school? Maybe they already left school. So what are your aspirations for them beyond school? What I want you to do, you'll notice there's a text box. I want you to send words 
and as many words as you want that come to mind of the things that you want your children to know and to be able to do beyond school. And we're going to take a look at the words that you're sending. So succeed, question everything, being empathic, to be happy, have interpersonal skills, to have choices, to have success, to be a global citizen, to be happy, life skills, ready for future life. I want to be a successful engineer and be a global citizen, to explore and discover, to be happy, to decide for themselves, to be great, to have life skills, to be confident, to be innovative. But there's something common about all these words. And I ask this question all over the world to leaders just like yourselves, and they always answer in the same way. What's common? These are all things that you hope for the people most precious to in your lives, your children. All these things all have something else in common. They're also currently things we don't prioritize in school. You notice that? Like, I have three kids, and I've never had my daughter come home from school saying, oh, Dad, I'm so nervous. I hope I do well on my confidence assessment on Thursday. Right? Like, kids don't come home worrying about their interpersonal skills, right? It's not something that's a focus in schools. Why not? Should that change? If you're not familiar with the OECD, actually right now, kids across the globe, you know, kids take the PISA assessments on literacy and numeracy. There are kids across the globe taking an assessment on social and emotional skills. The, assess the results will come out next fall. So the world is shifting in terms of how we define what student uh, success is. Now, there's a more important question, though. I asked you about your kids. The more important question is, here's a five-year-old girl from Africa. Are your aspirations for your kids the same as your aspirations for this child? And the reason why that's important is because of the following fact. Here's a map that shows connectivity, people that have access to the internet across the globe. This is figures from today. They estimate that by 2025, 2030, every single human being on the planet will have access to the internet, will be able to have a window to the rest of the world. 100%. Now, it doesn't mean everybody's going to own a device. It doesn't mean everybody's going to be connected. It means that everybody will have a friend, a brother, a cousin, the relative, the next-door neighbor, that they are going to be able to connect and have a window into the world. And what does that mean, and why does that matter? For this little five-year-old girl, when she walks home every day from school, in the street that she walks on, she'll be able to compare how another child walks home and what their street looks like. And when she goes to bed at night with her five siblings and looks at the room that she sleeps in, she'll be able to compare it to that child across another country and what they look at when they go to bed. And what this means is that kids' aspirations are going to change. Their reference income is going to change. When they see how people around the world are living and what's possible, it raises aspirations, which is a great thing, provided there's a path that they can see themselves taking that will help them get there. Because failure of having that path, what happens? People resort to what? Crime and violence. And this is why it's so important for all of you in the room have this unique opportunity to create the conditions for this child to see that path, to see the possibility, to raise their aspirations, and for them to actually see a way for them to actually achieve it. I'm going to push you a little bit further Here's a five-year-old boy from Ontario, Canada. I know this boy very well because he's my son, Marco. I'm going to push you further and say, when these two kids apply for a job, the same job, it is completely likely that this girl gets the job over my son. And I want to convince you of that fact with the following points. Hands up if you know the World Economic Forum. Yes? Have you heard the future skills report? So every few years, they come up with a future skills report. They survey thousands of different uh, uh, jobs, professions, hundreds of thousands of different skills that are required to meet those professions or meet those goals. And they look at the trends. So they had a 2020 skills trend report. Last year, they did something different. Last year, they look at the shift in nature of those skills. Which skills are growing? Which skills are declining? I just took a sample here. And what I'm going to do in a moment is I'm going to send this to your devices. So go ahead and get your devices out. Because what I'd like you to do, what I'd like you to do is I want you to take, whoop, 
I want you to look at this list. Let me go back. Almost there. And I want you to sort it. Try to guess which one of these skills are growing, that there's a higher demand for, and which one of these skills are declining, which means we're not seeing them so much on you know, applications for jobs. And this is across hundreds of countries around the world, hundreds of thousands of different uh, uh, careers, jobs. Which ones are growing, which ones are declining? So you should see them on your device, yes? You should see them on your device. What I want you to do is try to sort them. Now, if you don't have your device, feel free to talk with the person beside you and try to guess which ones are growing, which ones are declining. And I'll give you a minute to do that. We're trying to guess which skills are on the rise, which skills are on the decline. Give you 30 more seconds. And yes, compare with the person beside you. Compare what you think with the person beside you. Ten more seconds. Okay, here's what the data shows. Analytical thinking, innovation, active learning, learning strategies, creativity, original initiative, complex problem thong, emotional intelligence, and there's more. There's actually more than 10, right? I'll have the link for this file, hopefully get it. Uh, you, can, you can follow the link and get access to the entire report. Now, there's something interesting about this, though. When I ask this question, and I usually have more time and I work with leaders like yourselves, I ask this question in a different way. I don't tell them where the data's from. I just give them a bunch of skills, and I ask this question. In your country, in your schools, classify these skills relative to how frequently your teachers are developing them in your students. I get them to reflect on what they prioritize and what skills students are being developed in their classrooms. Can you guess what leaders across the globe put as results? I'll show you. <laughs> this is just a sample, by the way, so don't, uh, don't take it as, uh, oops, let's go back. Come on, one more time. There it is. So consistently all across the globe, the things that you see on the far right, reading, writing, math, right, visual, auditory, speech abilities, memory, verbal, auditory, speech abilities, uh, manual dexterity, precision, those are the things we do very frequently. Because right, that's based on our curriculum. That's from several, several years ago. Singapore might be the only exception, right? But even Singapore, Creativity, Originality, and Initiative, right? It's only halfway. What's common about this is that what we're currently focusing on in our schools is all the stuff on this stuff, on this side, all across the globe. This is what we do most frequently. But the world is saying, give me students that can do this stuff. So there's a dissonance between what we're, the world is doing and what the world of work is requiring. And this is why I say that these two kids have equal opportunity to apply those jobs, and this girl will be able to take it over my son. Because currently in Ontario, we're not having this discussion. What's happening in the schools doesn't change. We're not thinking differently about what we're preparing our students for. But in this room, in the next couple of days, hopefully it instigates new ways of thinking about how we're gonna prepare this child for that job so she can take it over my son's. And really, there's, there's an underlying message or theme here, which is all of you have to have this belief in your heart that every single child can apply for a job and take it from a child in Canada, from a child in the US, from a child in Singapore, because you're going to create the conditions to make that child prepared and able and be best able to apply for that position. And there's a saying that goes, you know, the mind won't go where the heart isn't prepared to go. And so it really has to start with, what is your belief? And you believe that it's possible. Now, let's get into tactics. So how do we go about doing this? And so some might say, well, we need funding, right? Some others might say we need time. Teachers need more time in the school day. Teachers, students need to spend more time, right? Others think, well, we need technology. 
right? Let's, let's see. Access to technology and different types of technologies, that might be a solution. I want to go through some of these. Let's take a look at money. In a moment, I'm going to send to you, and in fact, take a look at your devices. I'm going to send you a graphic. Now, I'm not going to show you the data, the results, but on the x-axis, we have how much a country spends on their students' education. And on the other axis, that's their performance on the last OECD PISA International Assessment of Science. So we have money versus impact. So grab your devices. You should have, you should have this graphic. And can we, pull up, can we pull up their results? OK, so what we should be able to see live, I want you to grab the green star and drag it over the graph that you think represents the world's data on this topic. So if you think, so this person here thinks, OK, spending matters, right? So if you don't spend a lot, you don't perform. But as soon as you spend a little bit, you start performing, and then it really doesn't matter, right? Someone changed their mind. They're down here. This person thinks, well, how much you spend doesn't really matter until you spend quite a bit, and then it really matters. Then student performance really goes up. Or maybe you think, hey, look, you know what? The more you spend per student, the higher your science score is. So go ahead. What do you think? Grab a star, drag it over the graph that you think represents the results. And each of those bubbles, by the way, is a different country in the world. I notice some people, uh, by default, pretend that their star is their country, and they put them all the way to the right, spending a lot of money and performing high. It happens all the time. That's great. OK, so now we can start seeing a balance. So what does the data show? Here's what the data shows. Money does matter, right? So you have Peru all the way down here. They're not spending a lot per student, or even Georgia. And those students are performing. By the way, this, this happens with science. This happens with literacy. This happens with numeracy. You know, compared to Lithuania, Chile, they spend quite a bit more, and the performance has a significant impact. But then after that yellow, those yellow dots, you know, Luxembourg, right, or Switzerland, look how much they're spending. Look at the, the ratio of how much more they're spending per student. And look at their performance relative to other countries. And this happens consistently. And what this is telling us is that it's not how much money, right? It's not, it's not the quantity of money that matters, right? It's, it's what you decide to do with that man, money that matters more. Right? So it's the actions, it's the decisions. Let's look at technology. How does this relate with technology? How can technology be a, a vehicle for helping us improve uh, and have impact? Well, tons of studies on technology and its impact on education. This is just one particular one. They were looking at students' digital reading skills. Now, that doesn't mean kids just reading stuff digitally. It means, hey, on Friday, you're going to the movies. You have four friends that you need to coordinate where you're going to watch the movie, which movie to watch, and what time you're going to watch it. Oh, and how much it's going to cost. And this is all done online, and they're tracking how students literally have a chat with fake friends to coordinate all this, and how they use resources like the internet to search movie times and locations and pricing. And then they compare students and they give them a score. That's their digital reading score. They also ask an important question. How often do you use technology in your classroom? Never or all the time? And there's a range. Now, I started showing you the beginning of the graph. On your device, you should have the same chart. And you should, on the, on the side, there's little, there's little dots. You can press the dot and continue drawing the graph. How do you think that graph continues? And talk with the person beside you. I'll give you about a minute. Talk with the person beside you. How do you think this graph continues? The relationship between students' performance and how frequently they use technology in their classroom. Go ahead. I'll give you a minute. Twenty seconds. Five seconds. So here's what the data shows. So yes, the kids who never use it, you know, these kids who use it a little bit more frequently, they perform better. But then after a while, these kids who use technology all the time, they actually perform worse than the students who never use technology in the classroom at all. And by the way, if you graph the relation between frequency of use of technology and the performance on literacy or numeracy or science or collaborative problem solving, 
you get the same results in countries all across the world. And what does this mean? Right? This means it's not about the quantity of time or how much access we provide of technology that matters. What matters more? It's the quality of that time. It's the decisions that are made about how we're going to leverage those technologies to serve what purpose, to have what impact. What this shows us is the world hasn't figured it out yet, consistently. There are pockets of success, absolutely, but when you look at it at scale, we're not there yet. So it's not quantity of time, it's the quality of time that matters more. And so we go back to this point. It is completely plausible that this five-year-old girl can be better prepared. You can create the conditions for this child over this boy, my son. Because these conversations aren't even happening at the district or at the government level about how we're preparing students, how we have to think differently about how we use technology or how we spend our funds. And there's a concept that I want you to internalize. And so what I want you to do is cross your arms for me. Everybody cross your arms, cross your arms. Now take a look. Some of you have your right arm on top of your left arm. Who has the right arm on top of the left? Put your hand up. People who have the right arm on top of the left. Okay, they say people who have the right arm on top of the left are more intelligent. There you go, that's what they say. Okay, who had left over right? Who had left over right? Put your hands up. They say people who have left over right are better looking. So there you go. It's true. It's true. Okay, so do me a favor. If you did right over left, do left over right. Do the opposite. Do the opposite. How does that feel? Awkward? A bit uncomfortable? Right? I noticed you, didn't, you, you can't see it from here, but when I asked you before, you're like, What's, where's this guy going with this, right? And then I said, do it the other way. You're like, you're, all your heads went down, and you're like, how do I do this, right? Anytime we try something new, it feels awkward and uncomfortable, right? Anytime you try something new, it feels awkward and uncomfortable. Do me a favor. Release your arms. Do it the awkward and uncomfortable way again. Okay, release your arms. Do it the awkward and uncomfortable way again. Release your arms. Do it the awkward and uncomfortable. What if we did this for the next 10 minutes? We'd waste 10 minutes I don't have, says the uh, ninja. But yeah, we'd get used to it, right? Okay, but here's the more important question. If I bump into you a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, and I watch how you cross your arms, how do you think you'll be crossing it? The way you're used to. Because as humans, we go back to what's comfortable and what we're used to. And when we talk about innovation, it's about being uncomfortable. It's about being comfortable being uncomfortable. And the countries who are going to prepare their children for the types of jobs and skills and the needs of parents and the needs of industry are the ones who are going to be comfortable doing the uncomfortable things, the things that have not been done before. Because if we keep doing the things we've done before, you see what the results show. We have the same results, actually dismal results, especially as it relates to technology. So we have to be uncomfortable. Now, there's an organization, you probably know it, the World Bank. They've experienced this. I don't know if you, you heard, but they did a massive analysis. What are the countries over the last 10 years that have you know, thrived versus those that haven't? What is the variable that's contributed to that? Education and healthcare. And so this is 2017 when he gets up and he says, we've got to reveal to our shareholders the powerful relationship between investing in people and economic growth. And they made it a mission. We want to accelerate not just the quantity, not, how, not just how many kids graduate, but what's the quality of learning? And what they basically said is, hey, look, for the history of the World Bank, we thought building roads, bridges, infrastructure, that's how you help a country grow. We were wrong. We've got to start doing something awkward and uncomfortable. Let's invest in people. So last year, I was invited to the summit. They had it in Bali, and a whole day was on human capital. And, they, and they, it's funny, because the organizers said, you know, Giancarlo, I hope that uh, we get one or two ministers that'll stand up and say, we, we believe in this, I'm going to join you. They didn't, just, they didn't just have one or two, they had 28. Now that number is at 65. That's 65 countries that say, yes, you know what? Our ministers of finance are not going against what they're used to. And we start prioritizing healthcare and education, investing in people. And I want to end with one Final message, and actually this, Christopher Duffy is gonna, actually going to end this message for you. Can we put the video up, guys?
I was asked to introduce Christopher and give a little bit of a, a timeline on his life. And uh, it's hard to keep my composure uh, talking about Christopher's story. But he was born in May of uh, 2011. 2001. <laughs> Thank you. You can tell, you can do it better than I can. I have to go back a few years, yeah. And he, his mother was on, on drugs, Oxycontin and cocaine. And um, he was a, a nephew of ours. And we went down to Florida and took him out of the foster care system in uh, August of 2002. And uh, he's been a blessing to our family. And uh, he, he loves to share his gifts. And this March, he was kind of discovered by the union leader and all the local media outlets in Boston. And uh, he's, uh, he's been singing a lot of patriotic songs. But to back up a few years, when, in 2004, Christopher was on our, his first mission trip with Eight Days of Hope. <laughs> and at four years old, he went down to the front of the, uh, the music ministry, and uh, they handed him a microphone, and he sang the song he's going to sing tonight, Open the Eyes of My Heart. share this video with you because Christopher teaches us the importance of opening the eyes of our hearts because the mind won't go where the heart is not prepared to go and what they didn't tell you is that gentleman who introduced Christopher when he was two years old Christopher couldn't walk Christopher couldn't talk Christopher couldn't see he had perfect pitch and that gentleman had an interesting choice to make because he already had kids. And those of you who have kids, you know, kids aren't that easy. Imagine having to raise Christopher. How awkward and uncomfortable that would have been. But what did he decide to do? He opened the eyes of his heart. He let himself be uncomfortable. And he started creating new conditions where now Christopher gets on stage every day and teaches everybody a very powerful lesson and he's teaching one with you today. The other reason why I wanted to share it with you because that feeling you have that kind of made you tear up and made you feel emotional. The next time you're in a meeting, have to make decisions, remind yourself of that feeling. That's you opening the eyes of your hearts. And there's no doubt in my mind that if you open the eyes of your hearts, you let yourself be comfortable being uncomfortable. You start creating the conditions, the opportunities to make better use of these resources, better use of your time, better use of technology. And create opportunities for these children, every child, every five-year-old child, to have their aspiration, aspirations risen, and you've created the pathway for them to achieve it. And it's no doubt that today and over the next couple of days, I encourage you to be uncomfortable and to think about the conditions you're going to create inspire greatness inside of Africa. I look forward to personally meeting all of you in the next couple of days and supporting you on that journey as well as Catalyst and the other founding partners because I know together we can make that a reality. And I thank you so much for having me here today.